Embryonic stem cells have amazing growth abilities, including the ability to turn into nearly any type of cell in the body, a property called pluripotent. For these reasons, stem cells hold the potential for treating degenerative diseases, injuries, and health conditions by replacing damaged cells with new healthy ones. But embryonic stem cells have their downsides. In addition to the ethical issues associated with their derivation from human embryos, a problem in general with transplanted organs and tissues is rejection, or attack by the body's immune system, where it senses cells from other people or sources as a threat. But what if we could make new tissues and organs directly from a patient's own cells? This video takes you through the actual research paper that formed the basis of such research. Stay tuned. Hey there, welcome to Science Is You, a growing channel dedicated to making real biotechnology research enjoyable and accessible to everyone. To support our mission, please subscribe to help this channel out. Thanks for watching. This groundbreaking study discovered the science needed to make pluripotent stem cells from a type of cell found in adult skin, fibroblasts. In these experiments, they took cells from mice and manipulated them genetically. To understand what genetic changes they made, we have to look at how the cell works at a molecular level. DNA, the genetic material, is like an instruction manual containing the blueprint for making molecular machines called proteins that carry out the various activities in the cell. Although all cells generally have the same DNA, they look and function differently because they are making different proteins, each coded by a section of the DNA called a gene. When a protein is made, the gene is first copied or transcribed into another molecule called RNA, which is then used to make a protein. But what causes the cells to produce different proteins at different times? This is one of the biggest areas of study in molecular biology. Cells can respond to cues in their environment by turning the production of certain proteins on or off. This is regulated in large part by proteins called transcription factors, which can attach to sections of the DNA and either cause or prevent the production of proteins by either helping or hindering the process of transcription into RNA. So if we want to take a skin cell and turn it into a stem cell, we just have to somehow trigger the cell to start making proteins that are found in stem cells, basically. But what proteins do stem cells make? And which ones are critical for making a stem cell that possesses pluripotency, with the capacity to turn into many different types of cells? Previously, several transcription factors and genes had been discovered that appeared to be involved somehow in the unique ability of stem cells to turn into multiple cell types. This study selected 24 such genes as candidate stem cell factors that they believed may be able to cause regular cells to become pluripotent. But how to test this? First, they needed a way to tell if the cells had become pluripotent or not. Pluripotency isn't necessarily that easy to just observe in the lab. Of course, we could observe the cells under different circumstances, exposed to different sets of chemicals, physical stimuli, etc., and determine if they are able to turn into different types of cells. But this wouldn't really be practical if you wanted to quickly screen the response of cells to 24 different factors or combinations of those. So the researchers here developed a clever system where they picked out one special gene, FBX15, that was known to be produced by pluripotent embryonic stem cells, but was not critical for pluripotency. Thus, cells that had become pluripotent would be expected to produce proteins from this gene. But having this gene turned off wouldn't prevent cells from becoming pluripotent. Think about it this way. Imagine an electrical circuit set up for a light bulb. Certain components of that circuit, the batteries, intact wires, etc. are critical for being able to make the circuit. You can make the circuit without the light bulb already being lit. But once the circuit is working, the light bulb will light. If you theoretically take off the light bulb, the circuit is still intact. But if you remove the batteries, cut out a piece of wire, take out a resistor, etc., the light bulb won't light. In this example, the imaginary light bulb would be the turning on of protein production from the gene FBX15. But how to see whether FBX15 is turned on or off? G418 is a chemical that kills cells unless they are producing a specific protein that protects them, a resistance gene. The authors used cells from mice that had been genetically modified to contain a version of the FBX15 gene that was followed by the gene for G418 resistance. In this way, if FBX15 was being transcribed or turned on to make proteins, the resistance gene would also be produced. By exposing cells to high concentrations of the chemical G418, the only cells that would survive would be ones that had activated the pluripotency indicator FBX15. 
The author's plan was to artificially insert a copy of each of the 24 genes or transcription factors thought to be involved in pluripotency, a copy that the cell would continually produce, and see which one or more of the 24 genes would enable the cell to survive. But how can we insert genes into a cell? It turns out viruses are very good at it. Viruses attack human cells by latching onto them and inserting copies of their own genetic material and tricking cells to make more of them. But in gene editing, viruses can be produced that carry different genes or copies of nucleic acids and used to deliver these genes that we are interested in into the cell, like a mini injection for the cells. In this way, the authors sequentially inserted active copies of each of the 24 genes of interest into embryonic mouse fibroblasts to see if they would survive on G418. And none of them did. So after all that work, none of these chosen genes were sufficient to make the cells become more like stem cells. Well, the researchers also tried inserting all 24 genes at once into the cells, and they survived. Further, some of the colonies or groups of cells appeared similar in appearance to embryonic stem cells. But were all of these genes really critical? The researchers wanted to narrow down which genes were critical to transform cells into pluripotent stem cells, and which were not. So they tried the reverse strategy, sequentially eliminating one of the 24 genes from the mix and seeing which resulted in the cell's inability to survive. They identified 10 such genes that when taken away would prevent the cell from surviving. When they inserted just these 10 genes alone into the cell, they got even better results than when they had previously put in all 24. This led them to question whether the exact combination of genes was really the critical thing. Could this pool of stem cell inducing factors be narrowed down even more? So they continued, they sequentially removed individual genes from their mix of 10 genes and came up with four that were critical for the cell's survival. When they inserted just these four into the cells, they obtained colonies that were resistant to G418 and were similar in appearance to embryonic stem cells. These factors were the genes for OCT34, SOX2, CMYC, and KLF4. This appeared to be the minimum number of genes that were critical for the transformation into an appearance like stem cells with characteristic pluripotency. The researchers named these cells IPSCs for induced pluripotent stem cells. But the researchers of course wanted to be sure that these cells really had qualities of stem cells. They did comparisons in both their IPSCs and embryonic stem cells to look at what genes were being transcribed. They observed that they had more activated genes in common with stem cells than with the fibroblast cells they were made from. There were a few genes that were more active in embryonic stem cells than IPSCs, which indicated that there were a few differences. But they did some additional tests. One quality of stem cells is that due to their pluripotent nature, if injected into mice they can form teratomas, or tumors made of several different types of cells. They observed a similar phenomenon when they injected IPSCs into mice, indicating that the IPSCs really are pluripotent. Another property of embryonic stem cells is their ability to form balls of tissue called embryoid bodies that contain cells from all three germ layers, called endoderm, mesoderm, and ectoderm, which later give rise to the major organs and tissues in the body. They were able to accomplish this with their IPSC cells, generated from the four factors as well. But could this transformation of fibroblast cells into pluripotent stem cells be repeated, or was it just a fluke? The researchers repeated this experiment, this time attempting insertion of active versions of the four genes into fibroblasts from the tail tips of adult mice. They were indeed able to generate IPSCs from these. As a further test, they made IPSCs out of fibroblasts that produced green fluorescent protein, GFP, and injected them into mouse embryos. In this way, they could track the movement of their IPSC cells and see how they behaved. They saw that their IPSCs integrated with the mouse embryo and became part of all three germ layers. This was a further confirmation that they were indeed able to turn adult cells into cells with embryonic stem cell-like properties by giving the cells active copies of four genes. This was a very important finding as it opened the door for possibly creating stem cells from a patient's own cells which could be used towards the replacement of damaged cells and organs. These four genes later became known as Yamanaka factors named after one of the authors of the study. At the time this study was published, the researchers did not yet know for sure whether the four factors could make pluripotent cells from human cells, since all these experiments were done in mice. But hint, a study on just that was published not long after. Stay tuned for the sequel. If you found this video enjoyable or helpful, please subscribe to help us out. And remember, 